All right, we are back. So apparently I'm starting a new series called Richard Brown Reacts. <laughs> All right. Take philosophical videos and react to them. So far it's been kind of fun, actually. And I've reacted to this Quine video. And right now I'm doing the Herbert Feigl and uh, Paul Firebrand. I still don't know how to say his name correctly. Maybe he'll say it in this little segment um, right here. Uh, but it's all right. So the, the audio is not great. Um, on this, I'm trying to, okay. So the audio is not great on this because it's a rare recording from 1962 and that's too bad. So I, I don't know. I think the last one, I'm not sure if it came out, but I'm going to listen to Firebrand's, uh, version of this and we'll see what we can do with it let's see <laughs> uh oh <laughs> that's the clapping from when he was done i was like what the fuck <laughs> i want to defend an out and out and very naive materialism and uh, to start with i want to say a little about uh, linguistic argument because if one starts with a mind-body problem, the first difficulty in suggesting a new theory or an old theory, which seems implausible, is it runs counter to. Maybe that's a little bit loud for me. Maybe his mic is. Um, let's see here. Okay, let's turn it down just slightly, though. <clears throat> okay, so wait, what did he? I already forgot what the heck he was talking about. So he says. Uh... Linguistic stuff and, first. Uh, to start with, I want to say a little about uh, linguistic arguments. Because if one starts with a mind body problem, the first difficulty in suggesting a new theory or an old theory, which seems implausible, is it runs counter to our accustomed way to speak. Professor Feynman has pointed this out by saying it is impossible to say, it sounds very absurd to say that thoughts may have extension, or that, for example, a pain I experience may have a certain weight. Now, this argument cuts, of course, both directions. If it is absurd to say that pains may have weight, this may indicate that the language we speak is very inadequate, because it might well be that pains do have weight. In this case, we have to abandon on our language. So before... All right, so I think what he's saying here, it's hard for me to understand with the accent, to be honest, and the, and the poor audio. I think what he's saying is that if you're going to talk about the mind-body problem, you've got to start first by talking about um, the language that we use to talk about the mind. Um, because if you're going to... Yeah, because how we talk about the mind is going to... Wait, let me... What the fuck is it? Okay, let me re-listen to this. Let's start it back over here. Okay. <laughs> It's hard. <laughs> in suggesting a new theory or an old theory. Which yeah, let me start all the way back. There we go. Ah, oh, picture. I want to defend an out and out and very naive materialism. And uh, to start with, I want. Did he say he's going to defend an out and out naive materialism? So, in the context of the last video, then. I take that um, to mean that he's going to defend a limitivism, um, given the way that the Feigl set up the debate from last time as a, a kind of contrast between the nothing mores and the, wait, the something mores and the nothing buts. <laughs> um, okay, so I think he said, I'm going to defend an outright naive version of materialism, which I interpret as a limitivism. Okay. And an out and out and very naive materialism. And uh, to start with, I want to say a little about uh, linguistic arguments. Because if one starts with a mind body problem, the first difficulty in suggesting a new theory or an old theory, which seems implausible, is it runs counter to our accustomed way to speak. Professor okay, so um, he has to start with linguistic IS, uh, considerations first, because if we're going to suggest a new theory, a theory that says that consciousness is, you know, doesn't exist or is physical or whatever. Um, but if the language we use to speak about it, the smuggling in assumptions, then we need to identify those. Is that kind of the point that he's making here? 
Let me check this out. Bolt theory seems implausibly is that it runs counter to our accustomed ways of speak. Professor Feynman has pointed this out by saying it is impossible to say, it sounds very absurd to say that thoughts may have extension, or that, for example, a pain I experience may have a certain weight. Now, this argument cuts, of course, both directions. If it is absurd to say... So he said this argument cuts in both directions. So I think what he's saying here is that... Um, so if, like Feigl was saying, it's a, you know, people think it's absurd to say that a thought has a length or weighs a certain amount or has a, you know, let's, it doesn't seem like, you know, a pain could be on, uh, weigh five ounces or something like that. So, uh, but that may be because our language, that the way we talk about those things helps us to think about it in that way. Um, whereas the thing itself may actually be, you know, <laughs> something that has length or weight. So the way we talk about it may misguide us into thinking about it in the wrong way. So here, I mean, I think he's going straight to limitivism. I don't know a lot about Firebrand. Like I said, I might brush with the limitism from the past is Ruth Rorty. So I know more about that. But of course, I've heard of Firebrand and I know he's a philosopher of science, but I think he's going to start. My guess is that there's going to be a lot of like theory ladenness of perception talk coming here. Um, and that the idea maybe that he's going to develop is a guess based on what I sort of know about what the situation here is, um, my the, my guess is that he's going to say, look, we have this sort of, you know, we talk about the mind in dualist terms, which leads us to think about the mind in dualist terms. Um, but uh, that's the wrong way to think about it. That's the wrong way to talk about it. Um, and so we need to, if we're going to take materialism seriously, or this kind of naive materialism that he wants to introduce seriously, then we're gonna have to uh, change the way we think or reconceptualize or um, recognize the snare of language. I don't know which way he's gonna develop, but that's my guess about the general theme is that his theory, uh, the perception is late, theory laden. We may have a, we may misrepresent the nature of consciousness. So to me, it sounds very much like modern illusionism and in fact, I've said this in many places before, but, you know, limitivism was the older name for this view. And illusionism is the kind of rebranding of it. But I still think it's basically the same view, in my opinion, right? I don't know. Um, with some fancy bells and whistles. All right, so let's see how he develops this. Extension, or that, for example, in pain, I experience may have a certain weight. Now, this argument cuts, of course, both directions. Even it is absurd to say that pains may have weight, this may indicate that the language we speak is very inadequate because it might well be that pains do have weight. Right, so this may indicate the language is inadequate because it may be the case that pains do have weight, but we our language isn't up to the job. Um, okay, it's hard to understand with the accent and the poor audio, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to hit here. So, okay, so it may be, that's why we have to start with linguistic considerations. That's what he's saying. The language we speak is very inadequate because it might well be that pains do have weight. In this case, we have to abandon our language. So before it has been shown... He said, in which case, we have to abandon our language. Okay, so that's limitivism, right? Um, that's the abandon the language stuff. So if, uh, if you're going to... If, 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 if the way we talk... If we say pains are things that don't have a weight or an extension, and then we find out that there's things in the, that we call pains in the brains that do have that, what do we say? We say, oh, well, the thing we were talking about doesn't exist. What do we say? We've learned out something new about it. Um, I think that's really going to be the debate between this guy and Figo. It'll be interesting to hear after his opening remarks the discussion that they have. There's 30 minutes of open discussion at the end of this, so we'll try to make it through his opening remarks today, and we'll see if we can come back for the discussion tomorrow. Fun stuff, okay. <laughs> the language which we use for describing such things like pains and zeitz and so on is adequate. And as far as I'm aware, nobody has shown it as yet. We can't use uh, arguments from language for defending, for attacking philosophical or physiological position. So I want to completely abandon all the arguments from language and start with an enumeration of various theories which were held about human beings. Indeed. So he says he wants to abandon all that talk about, like, can you start with the meaning of the mental terms and know something about their 
nature. Okay. Uh, but what was that last thing you just said? So I want to completely abandon all the arguments from language and start with an enumeration of various theories which were held about human beings. So I'm going to abandon the arguments that the, the uh, excuse me, I'm going to abandon arguments from language and start with an enumeration of theories about human beings. So I think he's just going to say, we're going to start with a general argument to the best explanation, but we're not going to try some conceptual analysis stuff. So I know in our day and age, it's a little bit hard to put ourselves back in the 1960s in this way, but conceptual analysis would have been all the rage. Would ordinary language philosophy already have been a thing, right? Um, people very, very hung up about the way we talk and how we would use the words and things like that. So he's saying, look, we're not going to worry about all that stuff, but we talk this way. Um, you know, uh, I saw an argument like this kind of recently. Someone says, <laughs> you know, we say, we don't say, we, you know, I, when, when, suppose you hurt your leg and you walk around, we say, I have a limp. We don't say my body has a limp. So this means I'm not my body because we don't talk that way. So I don't buy those kinds of arguments. And I think what he's saying here is like, we don't, we're not going to worry about those kinds of considerations. What we're going to do here is just put the theories. We're going to say, here's theory A, here's theory B. Um, and then we're going to stack them up against each other and see how they come out. I think that's what he's going to do. So let's continue. In these different theories, the common uh, notions which we use for describing what goes on in human beings will assume a very different meaning naturally because they're different theories. And I shall then try to show which one of the theories seems to be acceptable. So you see what he's saying? He's going to enumerate these theories. It's going to have the same word in, in both theories, like consciousness or pain may show up in both theories, but it's going to mean very different things. Um, and then he's going to try to show that one of them is good and one of them is bad. So that's going to be his strategy. Which one should be rejected? Which one should be rejected? I want the theories. <laughs> there are uh, monistic ones. See, I'm getting the feeling that they are writing things on a board as they're talking. Is that why there's that pause? He's writing monistic <laughs> on a board. I wish there was video for this so we could see what was going on. Um, but I'm glad there's audio anyway. So let's let's go back. He's writing something. I think he's writing monistic. The uh, monistic ones? Yeah, right. Physicalism, idealism. And pluralist ones. Pluralist, okay. And among the monistic ones, there is, of course, old materialism yeah, and... <coughs> what I could call an out-and-out spiritualism. The, le the latter I shall not discuss. I mean, partly because I don't believe in it. And uh, So he said, under the monism, you have materialism and spiritualism, which I would call idealism nowadays. But, you know, so spiritualism, just that the world is physical, or not physical, but the mental, in some sense, not physical. Um, he said, not going to talk about idealism or spiritualism because he doesn't believe in it. <laughs> okay, so wait, great, all right. Not because I think that any good arguments have been proffered against this one either, but simply I don't believe in it subjectively, and also because the time to show this would be a position like his. Uh, an out and out materialism, of course, says that human beings are nothing but a complicated arrangement of material attributes. Some of them are less complicated, some of them more complicated. Right, so that's materialism. Human beings are just arrangements of uh, particles, some more complicated than others. Maybe it's strings, whatever, maybe it's fields. So things have changed since the 60s. Um, but, uh, you know, be that as it may, you get the point, right? Okay. Now, one thing I want to point out immediately, that a materialist, if he's sensible, does not at all uh, deny the existence of pains, of thoughts, of sensations. <laughs> it's okay. What the fuck? <laughs> Why did they just? You're just gonna say that? That you're just gonna say the materialist, if he's sensible, doesn't recognize the existence of pains. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. That that's uh, wow. Okay. Straight up eliminativism. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's hear him say that again. 
I mean, I'm sure he's got an argument for it, but come on, uh, prima facie, that position is absurd. That's the kind of position that David Chalmers wants to argue against in that meta problem paper where he says, look, here's an argument against illusionism. If illusionism is true, then no one's ever felt pain. Um, but uh, people do feel pain. Therefore, illusionism is false. That kind of argument seems like it could... Um, it's going to work against this kind of eliminativism because he just said we're going to deny that there are pains. Now, we know what he means by that. What he means is that there's anything over and above <clears throat> the physical workings of the brain, a non-physical, non-mechanical, mental ob thing called a pain. To me, it seems like that's a mistake to say there are no pains, but I but I get the kind of view that he's making. I think he's going to you know defend this. There's no difference between reduction and eliminism for the view. All right, so let's but let's hear that again because that's just like that's my chef's kiss. <laughs> There's just no pains, obviously. Like you're a materialist, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Some of them are less complicated, some of them more complicated. Now, one thing I want to point out immediately, that a materialist, if he is sensible, does not at all uh, deny the existence of pains, of thoughts, of sensations. For a materialist, the existence of pains, thoughts, or sensations in the common, uh, in the common uh, sense constitutes a problem. Namely, he is to explain how these things can be analyzed on the basis of his materialistic ontology. Yeah, but so, okay. This kind of move really annoys me right here. Um, yeah, this kind of move really annoys me because, uh huh. So we shouldn't start with a from a theoretical point of view, assuming oh I'm a physicalist or I'm an idealist or I'm a functionalist or I'm a whatever ist. We shouldn't start from that and then say okay so how do we how do we fit mental how do we fit experience into that framework? But rather, we should start from the regular position that the experience is real. We have it. We encounter it. It's there. Right? We all have experience. Um, we see colors and hear sounds and taste tastes and feel feelings, <laughs> the whole range. Um, that, that much is obvious. And then so we start with the obviousness <laughs> of that and then look for where in the physical world it presents itself and if you really can't make sense of how that stuff fits into the physical world then you shouldn't be a physicalist um now i think you can make sense of how that stuff fits into the physical world but i, I think it's like a strategical mistake to say well look i'm a physicalist so if it doesn't cohere with my physicalism then i just reject it because then you end up rejecting something which is obvious now, I know he's going to say, yeah, but, you know, you have this linguistic claim and you're maybe you're misrepresenting what's going on. And, you know, maybe maybe all that's the, the case is, is the case. Maybe that's true. But I can't be misrepresenting it so drastically such as that I think I have conscious experience when I don't. That just seems to me to be like way too much. Um, so yeah, I'm not really sure about that that move right there. Uh, but but if you really want to tie like the meaning of the terms, that every one of these terms has to be tied to some kind of theory. Um, if they only get their meaning in the context of a, a theory or something like that, then you could sort of see where he's coming from. But but what I want to say is, look, you know, we start sort of. I don't want to say theory neutral. I don't know if I would go that far, but uh, you know, we start from a, a relative point of like there's the thing over there let's find out what it is in this respect the materialist is on the very same basis as the physicist physicists long time ago for them sound was what 
sound was a very quality phenomenon which went out in the outer world, went on in the outer world. Right, so that comparison right there with sound, right, so I think the comparison is that in the, you know, if you look at the history of physics, so if you go back to Aristotle, for example, um, Aristotle knew about sounds, obviously. Did he know about sound waves? No, they didn't have a theory about um, compression of air molecules and so forth and so on. They didn't know anything about the physiology of the ear, at least not to the details that, you know, the understanding that we do. Um, but they knew about sounds, but they thought of sounds as out there in the environment, like the sound that my voice is making right now, according to this older view, is in the room. It's The sound is out there. Um, but then as science progresses, the sound becomes an experience. It's not out there on the traditional picture of uh, science. The sound is um, a, a, an experience produced by going ons in the physical world, produced by sound waves, but sound waves are not sounds on this view. Sounds are conscious experiences or some kind of mental thing at least. So that's what he's describing here. Um, yeah, okay. Very qualitative phenomenon which went out in the outer world. Went on so a qualitative phenomenon that went on out there in the outer world. That's what, the way they thought of sounds. Outer world, it could be heard, there were different qualities to sounds, like the difference between an organ pipe and between a violin. There was different pitch and other things of sound, and also one could find that sound travels with a certain speed. Mm -hmm. Now for the physicists at that time, the problem was to give, as soon as they had adopted the atomistic theory, an atomistic account of the phenomenon of sound. And this atomistic account was given nowadays, I mean, everybody believes that sound is a vibration with a certain frequency in the air. As regards uh, uh, human beings, they, for the materialists, the problem is exactly the same. Here again, we start with certain qualitative occurrences. Okay, so you see the analogy that's going to be set up here, right? Yeah. So d you look at the case of sound. We start off thinking there's this thing out there that has these properties uh, as we experience them. Con that, you know, the conscious experience of the sounds is out there in the sound in the environment. Then we learn, no, 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 the sound is in here. What's out there is the um, the sound wave, but the sound wave is not a qualitative thing. So he's going to say we do the same thing in the case of the brain. We start off with something, well, hold on, let's see, how is this? In so, uh, human beings, they, for the materialist, the problem is exactly the same. Here again, we start with certain qualitative occurrences. Like in the first case with the quality of occurrence of heard sound in the outer world, we start here with the quality of occurrence of pain, whether in the inner or the outer world this has to be decided. And we want them to find of this quality of occurrence an analysis in materialistic terms. And if it is not regarded as uh, absurd in the case of physics that such an analysis can be given, then I don't see why it should be regarded as absurd in the case of... Uh, well, wait a minute now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So, what kind of argument is that? So, he's saying, all right, in the case of physics, we have the qualitative thing out there, the sound, then we learn about vibrations. But we don't think the vibrations are the qualitative thing. We think the vibrations produce the qualitative thing in us. For this analogy he's developing here to work, it would have to be the case that the sound wave was the qualitative thing that we discovered the, that the sound itself was out there and was the sound wave, right? That's, um, and I guess there is a way of talking where you can say that. So, I, I mean, there's something, yeah, in the background that's uh, bothering me here linguistically. So it seems like, so when we use words like colors, like red and or sounds like, you know, uh, banging or whatever, uh, pain, like throbbing pain or whatever, these, these terms describe the thing in the environment. We can say the object is red, but we can also say that we have a red experience. Now, they're not red in the same way, but uh, I think it's fine to say we use the word in both ways. Um, so I'm perfectly fine, happy saying the object out there is red, but what that means is that there's some physical property that it has, 
which uh, when I'm aware of it, I perceive it as red. It doesn't mean the object itself has the property that I consciously experience. It just means that the object has a physical property that I represent as being red or something like that. Um, so the object is red in that sense. It has a physical redness. It's just not the same as my conscious experience red. Is that what he's saying here? I mean, as an argument for just out and out physicalism, I guess I'm not. I don't. I'm not that sympathetic with that because uh, I don't really think physics has done what he says they have done. Or maybe I'm misunderstanding this. I don't know. What do you guys think? And if it is not regarded as uh, absurd in the case of physics that such an analysis can be given, then I don't see why it should be regarded as absurd in the case of uh, human beings that such an analysis can be given. And except if one holds in the very beginning ideology which forbids such an analysis. Except this means if one believes in the very beginning that the human being has also a soul. Now I shall immediately come to that kind of theory about human beings. So what he's saying is he thinks that you can give that kind of reductive or you know straightforward materialistic analysis, but if you already start off with language that that says you know pains are non-physical things, then you can't do that. So I, I get that that point. You don't want to you don't want to bang the the question here. And um, I mean, this is a point that's come up before. Sometimes people say, oh well, humans are you know sort of. Not, um, they're disposed to dualism already. And I don't really know if I buy that. We do make distinctions between physical and the mind, the mental, but I don't know if that's really the same as the distinction between physical and non-physical as opposed to like the way we talk about, we say humans aren't animals. Well, of course we are animals, but what we mean is we're special. We're not just animals. Well, anyway, so let's let's continue with this. But yeah, I'm, I'm very surprised at this, this style of argument. Um, Unless I'm missing something about like what he means by the reduction of sound to the sound wave. Yeah. Anyone know? <laughs> they want to fill me in. <laughs> now I shall immediately come to that kind of theory about human beings. It Dualism. is of course possible that sometimes people reject certain theories because they believe that human beings have a soul. But for me the interesting thing is what are the arguments they present for this? And the arguments as far as I can see are not very good. So he says, yeah, it's great. You could believe whatever you want, but what are the arguments? I'm very much in line with that sort of view, right? It's, it's fine to believe whatever you want, but I'm more interested in the arguments. And what he said, though, is the arguments for dualism aren't very good. Okay, so let's see what he says about them. Um, we come to this later. Now, pluralistic theories. Pluralistic theories uh, are also various kinds. There are some very complicated ones, like the theory of Aristotle. In which there is a material thing. Well, I have it. The theory, but did he say Aristotle? Yeah, Aristotle's theory is complicated. The hylomorphism stuff, is that what he's talking about? In color. Hold on. Um, are also various kinds. There are some very complicated ones, like the theory of Aristotle, in which there is a material thing, well, I should have it the same color, a material thing in a human being, a completely spiritual thing corresponding to the soul, and something in between the vegetative soul. Now, the material thing is just the body. The vegetative soul is the thing which makes the body move and crawl around, and which is possessed by people who don't, uh, who are not capable of thought. I mean, even by idiots, and by animals, and by very low forms of life. Even, even behaviorists get that joke. Did you catch it? <laughs> so we're just talking about Aristotle's theory, right? So Aristotle does has this complicated theory that the mind is separate from the body, but constitutes did by it or depends on it in some way in the way that a statue depends on its uh, material for um, being the kind of shape that it has but the statue is separate from this material according to Aristotle um, so the vegetative soul is the soul according to Aristotle the, that um, even animals and plants would have um, and even behaviorists he was saying ha 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 joke 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 uh, so it's not a mental thing okay so that's interesting so but what is this so this is Aristotle's theory that's great there's almost nobody who accepts Aristotle's theory. There are some hylomorphists, actually, I found out. Um, there is a contemporary school of hylomorphism. I'm, I'm hoping to get one on Consciousness Live at some point. Um, I know there's some at Fordham, for example, and I work with one who has written a dissertation on this uh, 
Anyway, no one cares. Okay, let's get back to this. People of thought, I mean even by idiots, and by enemies, and by very low forms of life. Even these low forms of life, according to Aristotle, consist of a material part, I mean like things and past, together with something immaterial, making it move. Yeah, he's saying even low forms of life have this aspect on their saw. I mean, so even so does the table. <laughs> so does a blue shell, right? As the non-material form of blueness um, as part of his constitution. So that's not very exciting. But yeah, that's it is true that Aristotle does think that in, as contrary to modern persons that, uh, you know, plants have souls and we modern persons would go, hmm, that's interesting. Um, okay, anyway, so, but what's this stuff about Aristotle have to do with materialism? And then in addition to this in a human being, there is uh, the soul, which does not make things move, but which enables people to think. And it's here that thought goes on. That's a fairly complicated theory. On the side of this, we have a simple the dualistic theory, which are those we have most frequently. Now, where is this now? Uh, where we say that human beings consist of two kinds of entities, namely... All right, so now he's getting the Cartesian substance dualism, I think, right? Okay. ...material body and something in addition to it, which is giving different, pop uh, uh, different properties, and then different relations, I assume, between the two. For example, a strict causal relation, both ways, or one-side causal relation, or parallelism, and so on. So there's a great variety of theories. Okay, so he just went through a whole bunch of stuff right there, but... Uh... You know, there's parallelism, which says the mind and the body don't interact. They just run in parallel to each other. There's epiphenomenalism, which says the mind, the body causes the mind, but the body, the mind doesn't interact with the body. Um, so he just kind of, and, you know, I have a whole video on the mind-body problem where I go through all the history of that stuff to, kind of as an overview. Not that anyone cares, but in case you did, there's where you would go. And the point here, of course, being there's a lot of dualistic theories out there. <laughs> Okay, what's this, why, why? Now, these are the theories so far. Now, I want to make a comment. Why should anyone discuss them? Do they have any practical importance, any practical reason? He wants to make a comment. Why should anyone discuss them? Do they have any practical importance? <laughs> you know, some people actually think those sorts of theories have had some practical import in the sense of negative impact, that if you think the mind, I mean, you know, some people say this is where our expression, yeah, he's lost his mind or she's lost her mind. So to lose your mind, but to be physically functioning, you have to think the mind is separate from the physical body. Um, some people have argued. And uh, so, yeah, or they, we could, you know, treat the mentally insane or people without minds in, in certain ways. Maybe animals can be treated in certain ways if you think they don't have minds. So in that case, people have thought or argued that uh, Cartesian dualism has done some harm. Um and in fact, I think you can even see this all the way going back to kind of Aristotle, actually, and Plato, Socrates, because, you know, Socrates notoriously um, thought that the since the mind was non-physical, eternal, and survived death, it was indestructible and all that stuff, then, you know, the physical world was fleeting and, and um, changing and, and impermanent, then it was less important and we shouldn't worry about it. And so, you know, um, it had some actual physical implications about the way he treated his health and what, you know, willingness to be executed, <laughs> so on and so forth. Okay, but let's see what he says. Uh, it has a tremendous practical influence whether or not one holds the theory of the one kind or the theory of the other kind. Okay, so he's saying, yes, it does have a tremendous practical... Okay, good, so what's the practical influence? It has an influence upon our ideas on education, on the medical treatment of human beings and all sorts of other things. Education and medical treatment? Interesting. Assume somebody is a very pronounced dualist and assume that he also thinks that thoughts completely belong to the domain of the mind and not at all to the domain of the body. And assume he is confronted with a person who has all sorts of strange thoughts and doesn't feel very happy about it. Now, if you think All right, so he's saying, imagine someone who thinks that there's a very hardcore dualist. They think thoughts only are in the mind, but they're completely separate from the body. So then they meet somebody. There is no very strong relation between mind and body, that these things are fairly independent, although occasionally they influence each other. 
he will be rather desperate. I mean, he will be rather, how could I say, it will seem rather difficult to him to read the mind and train it by the influence of the body. He will look for a method of directly influencing the soul and he will leave the body completely aside. Now, this leads to a completely different kind. So, what is his point here? If that's what you really think, then if you're trying to change what's going on in the mind, you're not really going to think of inter interacting with the body as a way to do that. Uh, because you really think these things are separate. I mean, I guess you'd have to be really a hardcore dualist who thought that there was no cop, maybe like a parallelist or something. But yeah, even there, because why can it be that, that you think that they're an interactionalist, you think that the mechanisms of the physical brain interact with the mind. So if you mess with them, you change the experience, much like messing with the inner workings of a TV changes what's on the screen. Uh, why couldn't it be like that, right? I think maybe this is not charitable. Unless I'm missing what the point that he's making here is. By the influence of the body. We look for a method of directly influencing the soul and we leave the body completely aside. Now this... So he's saying if you're really a committed dualist and you met someone like this, you would look for a way to directly influence the mind soul and just leave the body aside. But like the point that I was just making is like, yeah, you have to be like a really strange kind of dualist for this point to work, right? That, if you're an interactionist, interactive dualist, this point does it. Right, am I missing something here? It's to a completely different kind of a tech, let us say, on mental illness, than with an out and out materialist, who may, among his research programs for the cure of mental illness, is also considered perhaps injections. Whereas this person I may mean, be rather reluctant to think that injections can do anything. And he will sometimes run into trouble, for example, will try to cure in a rather spiritualistic way a tumor, which we don't know anything. So you see, these different things lead to different research programs, also in education. In education, for example, the main thing for this kind of person is to make the little child think as clearly of, as possible of certain abstract ideas. Behavior will not be so in, uh, of importance than, uh, than abstract thought. This means... <laughs> So you see where he's going. He's saying, okay, so in, in education, you're going to worry only about whether you they having certain kinds of experiences or thoughts. You're not going to worry about whether their behavior matches, like can they take a test or answer a question because the behavior is not important to what's going on in the mind. And they're, they're so, so the behavior doesn't give you any evidence about whether they learned or anything like that. If, if you're a hardcore dualist, I think that's his point. Um <laughs> I mean, really, is this, is this a fair critique of dualism? I don't, I mean, for the reasons I already said, I'm not sure if it's a fair critique, but uh, yeah, okay. Well, we will not try to control so much the behavior of the child, but the abstract thought we will try to have some direct uh, connection with the, with the abstract thought of the child with some kind of intuition. So that's why different uh, theories of education, by different practices of education will be connected with the different things. Now, the next thing I want to remark on is what arguments are there in favor of either one or of the other theory. And there so yeah, I'm not sure I buy that. There's gonna be practical differences in that way. I think psychiatry and mental health would go on roughly the same whether I mean, if you really thought like someone had lost their mind and the part that made them a person was gone, then maybe you could think that you could treat them in certain ways. But that seems very strange to me because, I mean, we don't have that attitude towards the dead, at least as far as I'm aware. Yeah, so anyway, I don't buy that argument, but let's see what the, what the other things he says about the arguments are here. Come to a very curious event. Namely, once a person believes very firmly in a theory like, for example, this one, that there are two different kinds of entities, then he will also be able to present a lot of empirical arguments for such a theory. This means he will be able to point to a lot of facts which everybody knows, which seem to support his theory. And if one goes a little deeper, however, in the matter, one will find that all these facts have, as it were, been swindled in, in a certain fashion. Namely, they are swindled in so far as they are the result of an interpretation of quite different facts in light of the theory one believes. 
I mean, you see what he's doing there. He's saying, look, so if you're a dualist, then you're going to, um, you're going to bring some facts to, to support your position, but those things have all been discovered by, you know, empirical behavior, observation, science, as we normally understand it. So they do, you can't really use them to support your position. Um, they, they, they don't, they, they don't support it. They support the other position because that's how they've been discovered. I think that's what he's saying here, right? <laughs> An argument that sounds familiar to certain persons I know. This means all the factual support of this uh, theory, much of the factual support of these theories is as a matter of fact circular. And therefore a discussion of... So the support is circular, uh... So you give reasons to believe dualism, but those reasons to believe dualism are, well, how is it circular? Let me hear this again. Did I misunderstand what's going on here? Okay, God damn it. Then he will also be able to present a lot of empirical arguments for such a theory. This means he will be able to point to a lot of facts which everybody knows, which seem to support his theory. And if one goes a little deeper, however, in the matter, one will find that all these facts have, as it were, been swindled in, in a certain fashion. Namely, they are swindled in so far as they are the result of an interpretation of quite different facts in light of the theory one believes. This means... So they're, oh, so he's saying they're swindled, they're sm smuggled in insofar as they're an interpretation of facts through your theory. So you're interpreting it through a theory and it's only because you interpret it in a certain way that it looks like it's evidence for your view, but that's not the right way to interpret it. Those facts, is that what he's saying? All the factual support of this theory, much of the factual support of these theories, is as a matter of fact circular. So how is that circular though? So you say, here's the empirical support of my argument, okay, that supports dualism. Um, but he's saying those technical things have been smuggled in because you've, ex you've interpreted them through the lens of dualistic thinking. So you say, here are the reasons that support dualism. Why do they support dualism? Oh, because I interpreted the evidence from the point of view of dualism. That's what he's saying, right? Um, that That's the kind of argument that he's giving right here. So what kind of empirical facts could he be talking about here? Let's give, like, so I, I think it's gotta be like the sort of things that I was talking about yesterday, right? That there's a kind of, you say, oh, well, the, the mind has an effect on the body. So the mind can't be the body, right? The mind has an effect on it. Um, like when I feel depressed, that's gonna, I'm not gonna eat my favorite food. So my, my feeling, my, my mental state affects my physical disposition. So there's a reason that to think that the mind and the body are separate, dualism follows. And he's saying, ah, but you've interpreted this bit of evidence that the, that the mind affects the body from a dualistic point of view, see? So you've assumed dualism, that the mind isn't the body, and then you point at this evidence and say, see, this evidence supports dualism, but it's circular because you've assumed um, that the uh, a dualistic interpretation of the evidence, whereas if you're a physicalist, you're gonna say, oh, the, the depression is itself a physical state, and that's what's causing the lack of eating or whatever. So I think that's the sort of thing that he's saying here. If I reconstructed it wrongly, Someone let me know, but I think, I think I got it. Okay. In light of the theory one believes. This means all the factual support of this theory, much of the factual support of these theories, is as a matter of fact circular. Okay. And therefore, a discussion of whether this theory is better or this, or this theory, which takes into account only one of these theories, and as it were the facts, seems to me, to be, uh, to be, to be uh, then to failure from the very beginning because once you have only one theory, this theory will uh, turn around the facts in such a fashion that the facts seem to support it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I agree with this and this is in a way 
very interesting because I think I was making points along these lines in like my paper, deprioritizing the a priori arguments against physicalism. And also in my review of David Chalmers' book, Constructing the Mind, which came out in, what was that, Philosophy Now or something? I don't know, one of those kind of paper things. Um, but the idea was, yeah, so we're going to use the same terms, but because we have different background theories, we interpret those terms differently. And all the evidence that we think is evidence for our theory is filtered through the way we're, the theory we already antecedently are holding. Um, so that uh, all, all you think that these facts are evidence for dualism, and I think these facts are evidence. You know, I see this all the time. So take a, take another example um, it, from what the kind of work that I do. So think about split brain cations, where you take a person, there's two hemispheres of the brain, left and right, they're collected by the corpus callosum, which is a bunch of axons streaming back and forth. You sever that, people go around behaving, for the most part, fairly normally. In certain circumstances, you can show that um, the two hemispheres are acting independently. Uh, okay, those are the facts. Some people cite this as evidence that the right hemisphere, so the in the language hemisphere is on the left side, so the person can you know, talk and say one thing, but if you ask him to to point with their left hand, which is controlled by the right hemisphere, they can you can get different responses. The response is that the pointing behavior disagrees with the verbal saying. They say, what did you see? They say they saw a word and they point at a different word. Um, okay, so some people say, well, this is obviously evidence that the right hemisphere is conscious and doing things. Other people say, this is obviously evidence that the right hemisphere is a sophisticated unconscious information processor. So is this a case where the people are citing something as evidence, they're really looking at the evidence from a point of view, from a theoretical interpretation, and they're interpreting that bit of uh, there as evidence from an assumed theoretical point of view. So I think he's talking about empirical evidence. I think a point I was making in these other things, I was talking about a priori evidence, um, that, that we do sort of something similar when we're doing a priori reasoning. Uh, but that's interesting. So obviously, these ideas, um, I'm influenced by by these kinds of ideas, although I resist eliminativism pretty strongly, but uh, very cool. Okay, so we're going to make it through his part today. I see I have about 15 minutes. <laughs> and how long have we been doing this? Gotta, oh, gosh. Okay, yeah. <laughs> what do you say? What did he say? Oh, he said, let me give an example of this. Okay. Okay, good. So I can check and see if my example matches his. Let's see what he says. There are various variations of this kind of theory. He also two entities. One variation says the following. Well, with the soul part, or with the psychological part, or with this part here, however we call it, the soul or the, the mental, the mental part of the human being, the non-material part. We are much more firmly connected than with the material part. This means we can have direct access to what goes on in our mind, whereas we cannot have direct access to what goes on in our body. Okay, so he's making a familiar point that we have direct, some people think we have direct access to the mind, not direct access to the body. Um, I don't know what's going on in my liver, but I know what's going on in my mind in a direct sort of way. Uh, Okie dokie. Um, great. And also what goes on in any other. As a matter of fact, our relation to our body is exactly the same as the relation to this baby. Wait, say our relation to our body is exactly the same as what? To what goes on in our body. And also what goes on in any other. As a matter of fact, our relation to our body is exactly the same as the relation to this baby. Did he say our relation to our own bodies is the same as our relation to other people's bodies? Is that what he's saying right there? That's different than our minds, obviously. Okay. Our body, as far as we are concerned, is an outer material object. And everybody knows, of course, it's about material objects. He says our body, as far as we're concerned, is an ultimate material object. Is, is that really the way we think about the body? Is that really the way you think about your body? This material object to drag around with you. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I know that if I had my foot chopped off, I would still be me. I mean, I'd be angry and I'd change my psychological states would change. Um, or depressed or whatever, depending on why my foot was gone. But uh, obviously, I would still be me. 
my job would still continue to pay me and people would still, my wife would be my wife, all that stuff would be the same. <clears throat> so my foot is not what I am, it's not essential to me. But that doesn't mean I think of it as just like something that's like the ultimate physical object. I feel, I feel it, I have a sense of my foot. The foot doesn't feel like a mental object, but it feels like a part of me, right? An ownership of it. Is that at odds with what he's saying? I don't know. Anyway, okay, so maybe that's a tangential issue. I get what he's saying, though, that as far as our body is concerned, you know, I don't have access. I can't. So even though I can feel my foot, I can't, like, know what's going on in the capillaries on my big toe. Okay, right. There have been many different theories, and these theories have been changed, and we have made many mistakes. And this is all due to the fact that we have only indirect knowledge about material objects. However, so the theory goes on, I'm still outlining the theory. We have direct knowledge of what goes on in our mind. For example, we have direct knowledge of that we have now pain or have not pain, and if we have pain, what the qualities of this pain are, and if we are thinking what the qualities of this thought are, what the content of Yeah, okay, so unlike the body, we have this kind of direct access to our mind, we know what the quality of the pain is. So I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna agree with all of that. I don't think it's infallible or anything like that, but I do think we have direct access to it. Okay, so what's your point here? <laughs> Where are we going with this? So he's just outlining a theory, right? So on this theory, we don't have direct access to the body, but we do have direct access to the mind. Okay. And if you have sensations, what the, what the qualities of these sensations are? Nobody can show us ever that we shall be wrong in this respect. Simply because we have direct access to our mind and only indirect access to the mind. So that's, that's too far. That's too far, right? So we'd, I'd say we do have direct access to the mind, but it's not the case that no one could ever say we're wrong. In fact, I, I'm open to the idea that we can be mistaken about what's going on in there, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a relatively kind of direct access to it, I would say. Now, this theory is very commonly accepted. As a matter of fact, I think it has cracked even into everyday belief. It's a theory which was not part of everyday belief some time ago. I mean, uh, so he's saying this, he thinks this view that he just outlined is the common sense view. Um, and that's interesting. I don't know if I, if I do think, I think that when I talk to people who are taking philosophy for the first time, psychology for the first time, they haven't thought about the mind very systematically. I think they're still naive realists. They, they're still with Aristotle. The sounds are out there. The colors are out there. Um, the pain is in the foot. You know, not in the mind. The pain is a physical thing in the foot. That's what I think the naive view is. But I mean, there's room for disagreement about that. What do you guys think the naive view is? If you regard this as something very obvious, try to forget that in the history of the earlier times, people had quite different attitudes towards their thoughts, towards their pains, and towards their sensations, even. But present day, the attitude is, if I am in pain, I am the only one who can know it. Also, I'm the one who can know most about it. Nobody can tell me anything more because after all, I know I'm So if I'm in pain, only I can know about it. No one can correct me. So he's talking about infallibility, incorrigibility, sort of subjective privacy, all that stuff. That's wonderful. Um, now, of course, I think, you know, we don't have to be behaviorist to say that we can know that someone's in pain by looking at their face. In fact, you know, I have, I get migraine headaches. And I remember I was at, a, I was in a seminar, I was in grad school, I was in a seminar and, uh, a buddy of mine said, hey, do you have a headache? And I was like, yeah, how'd you know? And they're like, I could tell just by looking at you. And I was, I didn't realize I was doing anything. I was just trying to listen and pay attention, but I had this like look on my face, I guess. I always have a look on my face, but I had like this <laughs> bad look, a pained look. So obviously you can fake that and obviously you can have pains without that expression. It doesn't mean that that's not a reliable guide or you're not expressing your pain or something like that. So I don't think you have to be a behaviorist to say that. But still, it, so even if you think that, that doesn't mean that I don't have a kind of special or direct access to the pain, that I don't know about it in a direct way, um, in a way that's unique, different from you, even though, so I think you could deny, I, I think he's going too strong. And I, and I think eliminativists like to do this a lot. <laughs> like I say, you guys believe all this wacky stuff, but we don't want to accept that, so let's reject your idea. But really, there, this is something Eric Switzkibel calls uh, inflate and explode, right? You, you take the concept and you just, you say, well, the concept has all this baggage, but it's too much, get rid of it. But of course, that's, some of it may not be essential to the concept. And so that's what I, that would be my response to this line of argument here. But let's make it through. We're almost through. About the thing which I, have. I only need to be very attentive. Nobody else can tell me that you have overlooked something because we have direct access to our brain's experience. So notice, that's the difference. So sometimes in the modern discussion people talk about revelation or something that you can know the essence of the thing 
uh, introspectively. Um, that's a different claim. So here he's talking about just more traditional claims that uh, you can't be wrong. No one can cor correct you. Um, you know, and at, at least at the common sense level, something like that seems right. I mean, imagine going to the doctor, them putting a measurement like a stethoscope or something on your head and then saying, oh my gosh, you're in extreme pain right now. We got to rush you get, get, get morphine stat. And you're like, what? What's going on? Like, I feel fine. And they're like, no, no, no. I just looked at your brain, uh, extreme agonizing pain. You're in it right now. And you'd be like, whoa. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't feel it. That seems like, who are you going to believe in that case? If, if that case, what I just described is conceptually possible, if you can conceive that it could happen, I mean, maybe it won't happen here in this world, but just conceive of it. Could it, could it ever happen in any conceptual situation that's not contradictory. Um, I think, yeah, if so, <laughs> um, then, you know, you have a kind of special access. I would trust you. You know about your own mental state in a way that the doctor doesn't. If you say sincerely you're not in pain, I take that as a reason to think, a serious reason to think you're not in pain no matter what the brain scan says. So, so I think he's making too much of this idea um, that these properties, and this is what the current day illusionists are doing as well. So this is a very timely, timely discussion that they're having right here. This is very cool. I'm glad I found this video. This is the theory. Now, how is the theory supported? The theory is supported by a reference to effect which is called the effect of acquaintance. And Professor Fag has mentioned acquaintance. What does he say? The, the theory is supported by equations? Called the effect of equations, and Professor Fag has mentioned. By a reference to effect which is called the effect of equations. Oh. Professor Fag has mentioned. Acquaintance. Uh, this is explained by acquaintance, which Professor Feigl has mentioned. I think that's what he said. Um, all right, so we have this direct access. So, you know, this is kind of Russell's view. You have direct, you have acquaintance with, and, and, and in some ways, so similar to Chalmers' view currently, um, you have acquaintance with these, with your conscious properties, but you know everything else indirectly. Okay, so what's, what's he gonna say? Acquaintance is too magical to, some physicalists think acquaintance is real. Um, I like acquaintance. What's the, what's the point here? <laughs> acquaintance. Acquaintance. Okay, good. And it's as follows. Why do we know so well? Uh, why do we know so well about our pains? Because once we say something about our pains, our assertion does not at all go beyond what we immediately perceive. Our assertion just describes what is immediately there. When we describe a table, for example, we say there's a table in front of us. I can be mistaken. I can have always say that it's the old trivial example. <coughs> and why can I be mistaken? Because in the case of the table, my assertion there is a table in front of myself goes beyond what I immediately perceive. Right, so that's the classic view, right? So you say there's a table there, but you go beyond what you immediately perceive because the view here is you perceive, what you perceive is the experience of the table. And that view of perception is outdated and, and leads to a lot of problems. So uh, we, uh, modern, I would say, not that you, what you perceive is your experience and the experience represents a table so that you indirectly perceive the table. I would say you perceive the table by representing it um, so that uh, you, you have a mental state which represents the table. That's what you perceive. Uh, okay, so, but this is the older view here, that what you, uh, that what you perceive is like a, a sense data or an experience or something, and so that you indirectly perceive the external world by directly perceiving your experience, so that your knowledge of the table is indirect, but your knowledge of your experience is direct. Okay, that's the kind of view. For example, by, there is a table in front of myself, I mean, among other things, not only that I have a certain perception, but I also mean that other people, both in proper position, would have a similar perception. I also mean that when people are sent in this direction, they will not continue walking and perhaps walk so as if nothing were here, but they will turn away. I mean, dogs will turn away. Also, when I take something and put it here in a certain position, and I let it go, it won't fall down, but it will stay. So the statement that I stayed in front of myself 
sees much more than I do. You can see. All I can see. All right. So there's other things too. It says there's a table. You can set things on it. You won't. You shouldn't bump into it. So there's a lot more contained in the statement. There's a table than merely the content of the perception. That's okay. So we get the some point. kind of uh, black and gray. But what I say is not only that I perceive this kind of black and gray, but that also certain kinds of things are going to happen. It is therefore a very rich statement, a statement with a very rich content. And it is for this reason that this statement is open to refutation. It has a very rich content, therefore it may be turned out that one of these things which are contained in this statement are wrong. For example, I do not see when I see the table that this won't fall through if it isn't there. I have just to make the experiment separate. And this may go wrong. This means that it might fall through. In case I'm in my eyes, I'm not quite right and I see a black and shaky without there being any table. So we have to, in the case of material objects, our statements go always far beyond what we immediately perceive, and it is for this reason that we can never be certain about the truth. Okay, right. So we get the point. You could be wrong. You hallucinate the table. It's not there, but you have the same experience, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's in external perception. Um, but... All right. How about the pain? When I say I'm in pain now, I have pain here, uh, 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 high up a motor or whatever it is, and when somebody else asks me what kind of pain, is it a, a throbbing pain, is it pain like a needle, is it going on, mm, mm, or, mm, 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 or so, yes, I can give him the answer. And can you refute me? Can he tell me that I have been wrong? Well, I haven't told him anything he could try out himself. I have only described what I'm immediately experiencing, and nothing else at all. And therefore, of course, I mean, he can never point out to me that I have been wrong. So, yeah, in the case of internal cases, though, you have the pain, you have a direct perception, not indirect of it. So someone can't tell you, there's no case that you could be like, oh, I thought that was a pain, but you're wrong about it. Um, but also notice how he just, he kind of is uh, mixing these two things that should be separated. So the one that someone else could come and say, you're wrong. So that's called sometimes incorrigibility. And the other, the infallibility claim that you could actually be wrong. So even if you have the best evidence, you could still be wrong. So even if someone can't come and correct you, really, you'd still be wrong. I actually think people can correct you. And that's so this stuff is, as we already said, so, you know, uh, these things they don't need to go together. But they do traditionally go together. He's right about that. So in the case of pain statements, the fact that we seem to be so directly acquainted with pains that nobody can ever show us that we are wrong is directly connected with the low content of the statements in terms of which we talk about pains. So we have here parallel... It's directly connected to the what content? ...ever show us that we are wrong is directly connected with the low content of the statements in terms of which we talk about directly connected with the low content of the statements. The low content of the statements? In terms of which we talk about things. So we have here parallel to this theory which says one thing we know with certainty, the other thing, well, we may, we may not, we may be often mistaken, two different classes of statements. And right, so that's the traditional, so he's just setting this theory up to compare it to the materialist theory, right? Two different classes of statements, one you know with certain T, the ones about your own experience, one you don't know a certainty, the ones about the external world. Statements which have a low content, which are very poor in content, they just describe what is media experience, and statements which are rich in content. Oh, is he saying low content as contrasted with rich? So not rich, they have a low content, a rich content versus a low content. Okay, so he's just saying that the content is that there's an experience, uh, the content of the experience. The other is the rich content because it goes beyond the experience, right? Okay, I think that's what he's saying. Apart from what is mean the experience, also many other things, namely what would happen to classes, one puts down, and so on, and so on, and so on. And usually, those defending the theory that there are two different kinds of entities, body and mind, that was goes on in the mind, can be experienced directly. And one can never be mistaken about it. As long as what goes on in the body where it can be mistaken about it and so on, point out to the fact that as a matter of fact, our, our statements are used in such a fact that we make very safe statements in one respect and not very safe statements in another respect. Now the question is why do we do this? Why are we doing such a thing? Well, why do we enrich the content of the table statements on the one side in such a fashion? Well, obviously because we know quite a lot about tables. I mean, we know not only that one can see them, 
But we also know that they are solid objects, which when they uh, are confronted with other solid objects, will stop them from uh, moving further. We also know that dogs can see tables. And so we also know that tables reflect light. I mean, all this we know, and all these our knowledge about tables, we pack into the table statements, and therefore, thereby make the table statements very vulnerable. So the rich content of the table statements is explained in that fashion. Now, why are the pain statements so very poor? Don't we know anything about pain? No, there quite a lot is known about pains, about the physiology of pains, and about how pains come about, even if there is no, no tooth aching, but I mean, if people imagine it, quite a lot is known about pains too, and so about thoughts, and so about sensations. The physiology of sensations, I mean, there are quite a lot of things, one can read, thick books. So the question is, why is not this rich knowledge uh, packed into the, into, the, into the statements concerning pains too? Because there it is. And after all, how we use our... So, yeah, that just seems like a confusion to me. So it seems, I think what I'm getting from this is that he says, okay, so when we talk about the table, we have this rich concept. Connections, well, how you use it, what it does, other people seeing it, it's subjective, it's out there, blah, blah, blah. When we talk about the pain, though, we have this very, you know, poor or low concept, whatever you want to use, but it doesn't, it just picks it out in terms of how it feels, but it doesn't pick it out in terms of its connection in this way. Um, but it just seems like you're going to have different concepts. Uh, this is what we we're talking about last time. So you could have the concept, this kind of social concept about that's the rich one that he's talking about, but also the phenomenal concept, the the concept that picks it out in terms of just how it feels. So why not have, why not say you can have both kinds of concepts? Um, yeah, so I'm not really... Yeah, okay. But I think I see what he's saying. Concerning chains too, because there it is. And after all, how we use our statements and what content we give to them depends on us. I mean, nobody can describe us to make the one low, the other high. The other content high. No. Well, my suggestion is simply because people believe in this theory here. Because they think they have uh, immediate access to things and have not so immediate access to material objects, therefore they arbitrarily reduce the content of pain statements, exclude, prevent the knowledge they possess about psychological affairs from entering this content. And then so, right, so what he's saying then is that because, the, uh, because of the way that we think about the, the concept that we have of a pain, so, so that, we, that the, very, the very way that we set up or define the concepts precludes us from being able to entertain the hypothesis of physicalism or materialism. Because what we've said is that physical objects, we don't have direct access to. M mental objects like pains, we do have direct access to. So, but then meant those pains can't be physical because we just said physical objects, we don't have direct access to. Pains, we do have direct access to. So we have a kind of easy argument that the pains are not physical because they are the sorts of things we have direct access to. But then you could get, so I, I, now I like what he's saying because we could just come along and say, no, 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 you're, you're begging the question. Your, your argument is circular here because you're assuming that um, the kind of, the pain is non-physical, right? That things are, that we have direct access to are not non-physical. So maybe some physical things are things that we have direct access to and some physical things are things we don't have direct access to. That way leaves the question open and then we can look for the evidence. So I, I think I see where the argument here is going. All right, cool. Well, they arbitrarily reduce the content of pain statements, exclude, prevent the knowledge they possess about psychological affairs from entering this content and let it enter here. But then if that is so, the argument from acquaintance which says we know pains directly and from acquaintance is circular. Because why do we have this direct knowledge about pains, because we refuse to fill up the pain statements with the rich knowledge which we possess about pain, sensations, and so on. Why do we so this is why I think like the move to pure phenomenal content, someone like Chalmers is gonna make, is gonna say, look, no, we could reduce down the thing, not reduce it, but we could strip away the things that are the things you're talking about. And we still have this coherent concept of the experience as it presents itself to us, as we feel it, as we experience it, and then we can ask questions about whether that's physical or not. Um, and I agree that you don't want to define the concept as such a way that it can't be physical. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think the distinction between epistemology and metaphysics is helpful here. Uh, these things may have lots of epistemological properties, or what, properties about how we know them, which may be um, 
interesting and special, but that doesn't mean they have metaphysical unique properties, that, that, that they are themselves unique or special. Just maybe the way that we know about it is unique or special. That's the way I would interpret it. All right, let's finish we this. We used to fill them up because we hold the theory we want to support by the result of this very same refusal. We start off with acquaintance. We said we have acquaintance, direct acquaintance with these, these um, mental properties like pains, these qualities. Um, they're not physical because we have direct access to them. Uh, but why do we not fill them up with the connections to behavior and blah, blah, blah? Because we're trying to support a theory, a dualistic theory. Um, so if we did that, then, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't have a dualistic theory. So this reminds me of a, a kind of a style of argument that David Rosenthal makes sometimes. And, you know, David Rosenthal did his Ph.D. with Richard Rorty and Rorty before he abandoned analytic philosophy, quote unquote. Um, was a, an eliminativist. So it's interesting. I'm not saying David Rosendahl's an eliminativist. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it's interesting that there's a style of argument here, which you can see a strand of in his thinking, which is that the the dualists of the world, like David Chalmers, according to Rosenthal, um, they, they start with a first-person conception of consciousness that the only way to know about it is from the first-person point of view, sort of what Firebrand is saying here, right? Um, and then, they, but they define it in, or not define it, but they gesture at it in a way that they say, you can't say anything about it. It's a simple thing. Uh, Ned Block's famous quote, if you got to ask, we ain't never going to know, quoting Louis Armstrong. Um, so that their very way that they start off prohibits you from ever saying or giving a theory or closing the hard problem, got explanatory gap, because they're sort of saying, look, here's this thing that resists explaining. Gee, we can't explain it. So it must not be physical. Um, that physical things are explainable. This thing, we defined it as not being explainable. So there's seemingly, there's a, there's an, a, a sim, and so Rosenthal thinks you need to start with kind of a, a different conception um, of how you know about mental qualities instead of from the first person, you can define them in a functional way, blah, blah, blah. And we have argued about this a lot because I think, you know, you, you do have the kind of first person access that's direct and you, you doesn't, it's epistemological, not metaphysical, the point I was making earlier. So, but I, but it's interesting to see this this strand of argument tracing back in history. So I think this is cool to, to see this. All right, so let's continue. So here you have a very nice example of an argument in favor of a theory, which seems to be very surprising and very strong indeed, because one can say, of course I know for certain, for sure that I have pains, but I don't know for sure that I have a table. And this argument is completely correct. So notice that's a that right there is a paraphrase of like Descartes' argument. Um, I know for certain that I have pains. I don't know for certain that there's a table. So pains are not physical. Um, well, okay. So you're assuming that the things you know for certain can't be physical. Maybe this is just a special physical fact that you know for certain. So okay, good. For sure that I have pains, but I don't know for sure that I have a table. And this argument is completely collapses because it's very only if I'm carrying through a procedure which will be carried through only in combination with theory. Now, of course. So he says, okay, so that was the Descartes point we were talking about earlier, but now I can hear what he's saying right there. So he says, okay, so you have this this argument, but it completely collapses because the only support for it is that you are starting from the point of view of that theory, right? That's the basic uh, critique that he's making here. If the situation has become a little more social, this means if we're not only one individual believes in this theory. So what do you say if the situation becomes more social, so more people now are believing the theory? But if uh, if the collective of people believes in this theory, for example, the nurses who teach the little children how to talk, and if they teach the little children how to talk, and of course people won't know where this different content of the status will come from, and we will think that there is a real factual argument now against the theory, but there isn't. Okay, so now you see what he's doing. So now there's a group of people that sort of have internalized this theory and you're a little kid there and they teach you to talk this way and they say the mental is something that's directly accessible and the physical is not and you have direct access to pains. The implication is that the pains are not physical, so you draw the conclusion um, and you think there's actually good argument for it because they talk about acquaintance and so forth and you don't really see that um, there's been this kind of linguistic definition that's precluded that's ruled out by definition um the alternative approach and that i do think is a danger uh that we don't want to rule out the alternative position by by fiat or by definition so this is i think these are important lessons for us to keep in mind in many domains but especially especially about the mind consciousness okay so let's finish this up 
It's getting long. Oh, it's completely circular. And so, I, I say, I mean, this was only an example in this time, it's not very long, I must let it, uh, stay with this example, all arguments in favor of the one or the other kind of solution of the mind-body problem are circular. <coughs> so what do we do under these circumstances? Yeah, so all arguments are circular. So this is very much a, in agreement with my deprioritizing argument. So what, what my point there was that... Um, that these kind of thought experiments really show what implicitly, what theory you're implicitly assuming, very much in line with what he's saying, although I would draw ultimate differently con different conclusions from these facts. But it's interesting to hear um, this line of argument being used for, well, I guess he hasn't really said he's an eliminativist yet. He just said he's an out and out materialist. But given what Feigl said in his first part of the speech, I've been assuming that's a limitivism. Maybe I should be more charitable. Maybe he's just trying to say like real physicalism. Um, anyway, I, yeah, I don't know. What, what, does anyone know what his ultimate view is here about limitivism? I guess uh, in a common discussion, okay. This means the work for those who have allowed the belief in this theory so to infect their language that uh, they describe the word in such a fashion that the word grins at them in the features of their theory. So all these arguments are circular. So what shall we do? I mean, what is our, uh, uh, how shall we... Yeah, so what's the way forward? Uh, my answer to that question was we need to concentrate on empirical work um, and then uh, examine all the theories in light of a lot more empirical work. <laughs> Choose between the theories. I think the only way to choose between the theories is not by comparing each single theory with effects which will be falsified in their specific ways, but to compare the pairs, one theory and its facts, the other theory and its facts, as regards their internal richness, their ability to pro predict its own facts and their satisfactory coherence inside the theory. This means you must take each of the theories together with its own facts, which are in fact in that fashion, <laughs> and compare them. Does this theory give a more satisfactory account of its own facts than this theory of its own facts? Is it more so you need to evaluate the, the theories internally from the point of view of the theory, the way it explains everything. He calls them their own facts. I wouldn't put it that way, but we know it, what, we, what he means. Um, uh, there, so the overall, what they, how they, uh, the theory accounts for all the things that it thinks of as facts. Is something left out here or there, and so on. This is the only way in which we can pro in, in, in which we can proceed. Now, to return to the earlier thing, I want also to emphasize. I want also to emphasize that this is a a, a, a very important thing. I mean, for even scientifically, it's not an idle affair of the philosophers, because as I pointed out to you. Social theories, theories of education, theory of treatment of mental illnesses, all depend on, on what kind of mind-body theory one has. Either consciously, then that is good, because then one is aware what one is thinking about. Or unconsciously, but that is bad, because then one doesn't know what one is thinking about and what prejudice one unconsciously is. Yeah, I think that's the important point, is that we may have these theories implicitly or unconsciously, and they may influence the way we react to certain thought experiments, certain pieces of evidence. They may influence the way we interpret the evidence. I don't know if they influence like all that other stuff like we were talking about before, but still, I, I think this is an important point he's making right here. Uh, infuses into everything. Now, finally, let me only make one remark which I down here about the utopian character of materialism. Well, every scientific theory is to a certain extent utopian. And materialism is also utopian as regards the material world. And nobody has as yet given a satisfactory account, I mean, uh, assuming that the classical physics is still correct, of the behavior of solid objects. Nobody has given a satisfactory account of the behavior of solid objects in the present theories. This means, concerning every theory, there is a large area of things which one knows, which are very large and just very recondite things, which are not at all treated by this theory. And so in this respect, every theory, whether it is applied now to human beings, whether it is applied to domino physics, has always a strong utopian character. And this is sometimes, however, forgotten. What's the utopian? So utopia, he doesn't mean like a perfect world or something. What does he mean like... What does he mean by utopian here? I'm, I'm not from... I don't know how he's using that word uh, so that it's kind of idealized. Is that what he means? That every theory is idealized? Um... 
what? In this respect, every theory, whether it's applied now to human, human, human theory. of things, which one knows, which are very large and just very like that things, which are not at all treated by this theory. And so in this respect, every theory, whether it's... There are some things not treated by the theory. So in this respect, the theory is utopian. I don't understand this part. Does anyone know what's going on here? Now to human beings, what is it like the domain of physics has always a strong utopian character. And this is sometimes, however, forgotten when uh, these domains in which the theory is not applied are not very much publicized. So one forgets about them. So one thinks the theory solves everything. And only in the case of the mind-body problem. So that's utopian in a sense that solves everything like gives us the solution to every problem is that what he means by utopian that it's a solution to every problem so he's saying no this materialism is maybe a solution to the mind body problem but maybe it doesn't apply to numbers or something is that what he's going to say let's see um, where this inherent prejudice of dualism is always present and always feels uncomfortable when materialist comes along only there the utopian character is recognized where it is present in all the other cases so how is that utopian? It's only when you have the physicalists come along, the materialists come along, that you see the dualist theory is utopian. I don't really understand this point. <clears throat> I got to stop too, because I got other things to do today, but I'm looking forward to getting to the last bit of this, which is an open discussion between Feigl and Firebrand. So that'll be cool. This has been very fun to react to so far. So we'll finish this off, hopefully tomorrow <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, cool.